Uh, yeah, well, it's, a, it's a, a basically an interview with uh, Leonard Harvey, uh, known uh, in the radio world around the Muskegon area, Steve James. Mm -hmm. Worked at uh, WMUS and started his career. But uh, we, we just want to get some uh, information about um, your history of radio in Muskegon. Oh, sure. Uh, and so uh, when did you get your start in radio? Actually, I was 17 years old. I was still in high school. I had another month to be at Muskegon High. Uh, I started out at WKJR 1520, I believe it was AM, and it was a it was basically attempting a music format. It had been a religious station, but it wanted to be more middle of the road. Tried that for a summer. Um, I get a call from Tim Actorhoff a few months after I'm there, and he says, "Why don't you come work the night show at MUS?" When I resigned from the job, I love it. The guy said, "Well, it's a good thing you you took this other job because they were thinking of firing you." So I said, "Okay, I dodged that bullet." I go to MUS. I'm there for maybe two, three months, and I get an offer to go to this new station called WQWQ FM Stereo 104.5 with beautiful music, 18 and a half hours a day. Uh, I still remember that, I don't know why. And I was there for about three months till one Sunday morning I fell asleep on the air. <laughs> I didn't get fired, nobody caught me, but I, I called Tim the next day. I, I called up Tim Akterhoff and I said, Tim, uh, I fell asleep on the radio. I don't think this is where I need to be working. I'm 18 years old, you gotta give me a job. He said, I was thinking of calling you anyway, I'll go ahead and I'll hire you back. Uh, long story short, I, I did that for, you know, I was on the air then at MUS for five years, went into ad sales for seven, uh, was marketing director for a year, was sales manager for a year, and got promoted to run and manage the radio station in Duluth, the classic rock station up there. I was there for about five years, uh, worked for the full service AM in town, KDAL, 96 Light, very successful. Got fired from there because they eliminated my position, laid off, I suppose. Then I built a radio station along with some business partners, two of them. And we had that station in northern Wisconsin, a 50,000 watt FM, for five years. We sold it. And then I went to the newspaper for ten and a half years, worked uh, for a regional magazine for about a year. And then I went to cable television charter and worked for them until I retired last year in 2018. Yeah, you, you talked about uh, 17 years old and working, going into the radio business. Yeah. But you, somebody at, uh, in your high school career, oh. Muskegon High School, a guy by the name of Frank Bowling. Yes. You know, I mean, his name keeps coming up. And, and it a lot should. Of people that attended Muskegon High School. And it really should. He was extraordinary. He had actually been a disc jockey in Battle Creek in the 40s and early 50s. Decided that he wasn't going to make enough of a living doing that for what he wanted to do, so he decided to go to college, got his degree in teaching, convinced Muskegon High School to let him not only teach speech class, but to be a radio television teacher. He created a studio in his homeroom, which was room 310 where he taught. He had a studio where he had a board operation in one studio and microphones set at a table in another. So he really created the experience of being able to talk to the student body. What we did is we read the announcements in the morning. Right. We called it MHS Morning News. And uh, he would engineer We'd be on the microphones, and uh, it would reach the entire student body during homeroom. So in my time, there were over 2,000 students. Oh, yeah. This was a big deal. And, of course, the great part of it was you, you did one of these broadcasts, and they took, what, two to five minutes every morning. And you, next, then that day, you're walking down the hall, and people are calling me Paul Harvey, of course. <laughs> hey, you, is Paul your uncle? You know, all that, which I loved. Um, so, so it was great, uh, but to, to Frank Poling's credit, what he did in 20 years of teaching before he retired, so he started early 50s, I was his last student that went into broadcasting. During that 20 year period, he had 20 students that had gone into professional broadcasting. Really? Really? So he was a guy who had really taken education to a different level. Sure. He, he, we actually ended up with jobs. Now the people that in this list includes, uh, Tim Achterhoff, Harry Brown, who were, you know, legends at MUS, right. um, 
And, and a guy that I believe was in his class, I would assume he had to be, was Jim Baker. Oh, who was the yeah the PTL guy? Yeah. Uh, because ten years before I graduated, Jim Baker graduated Muskegon High right, right. and grew up in the same neighborhood I did. I didn't know him personally, but it was amazing that you know the the people he had go through there. And there's a list that's a mile long of people that Frank Poling had taught that went into the media business. Most of them as radio broadcasters. It would be interesting to find a list of the, and we'll get a list together. We'll try. Yeah. For, for the radio history, but yeah. to, to do that at a high school at that era. Yes. You know, uh, it that was, era, and it would, had to have been breakthrough. Oh, it had to be. He yeah. was very progressive, and, and I always thought that uh, Frank Poling had a, demonstrated to me he was a good marketing guy. He, he could tell the story of why they should do this. And he was able to show results of what it did in terms of students turning into professional broadcasters. Oh, sure. It's one of the great stories, I think, that doesn't uh, get shared enough. I, I think Frank Poling uh, deserves all kinds of credit. He was an interesting guy because he had been a freelance newspaper reporter yeah. at one point in his life. So he had multiple media backgrounds. Interesting. Well, this, this uh, uh, undoubtedly uh, he'll be a name that will be mentioned in the uh, radio history. Yeah, of, I think he should be, because he really did have a major influence. There you go. Any crazy stories? I mean, in your time at MUS, oh, I, mean, geez. I mean, five years is, is like a lifetime. Oh, <laughs> and being on the radio. You know, I mean, to pick out a crazy story is probably asking too much. Crazy stories. Maybe, <laughs> is, is, is the uh, the best way to do it, but uh, in, in your time on air oh at, my gosh. at MUS. I, I think about, there's a couple, three that, that jump out. One is, and of course they're always on the phone, one is, I, I and this is one we'll never use actually, so I'll just share it quickly. Uh, I get this lady calls up on Tradio, you know, buy, sell, or trade, Tradio. And she's going along reading her item that she wants to sell, and she burps. And, of course, this was live on the air. This was not with a five-second delay or whatever. So she ends up burping, and I'm a 19- or 20-year-old cocky kid, right? A real smart-ass, let's be honest. And I go, she, you know, she's reading along, and she burps, and I go, get any on you? And she, and she goes, what did you say? I said, nothing, ma'am. What is that phone number they should call? You know, and, and I didn't think any more of it. And then Tony Wright, who was one of the disc jockeys, walks in, rolls open the control room door behind me, and he says, get any on you. I was listening in my car. I almost drove off the road. I was laughing so hard, you know. So, you know, there you go. Dumb, dumb thing. Um, I, I remember I got a chance to give away a car. And that was something new. We'd never given away a car. And it wasn't like we were giving away the whole car forever. It was a car that you would get a free lease for a year. And I remember I had somebody that had called up. And eventually, I mean, all the announcers throughout the day had a chance to give it away. And I happened to be the guy that actually gave it away. And uh, the lady was thrilled. And I, I thought, wow, I gave away a car on the air. I mean, how cool is that, you know? So, and of course, then in those days, it was fun. We, I was doing nights. Yeah, I was on the air at night first uh, for a couple of years. And I remember Tim Actorhoff came in one day and he says, hey, when you're done with your air shift, you got to clean out the garbage. You got to take all that teletype print from UPI and AP. You got to put all of that in a bag and you got to throw it out so we can toss it. So I said, well, I'm a disc jockey. You know, I'm a, I'm a professional broadcaster, <laughs> hey? And he goes, well, he says, this is part of your job. <laughs> so, so that's what I did. And I was, you know, like dumping cigarette ashes and, you know, you're doing all this stuff that I didn't smoke, but other people did. And it was like that was, I had to kind of police the place, you know, as far as the, the you know, conditions before I left at midnight. And, you know, and in those days we signed off at midnight. So it was, you know, of course now everybody's 24 seven now, but yeah, it was good stuff. We got a lot of fun. The Working with the announcers was a treat. Um, Paul Erickson, was such a talent. Uh, he's in Detroit. He's been in Detroit radio for years. Uh, Paul's dad, I believe, was the 
superintendent, I think, at Mona Shores at one point. Um, Erickson, that would have been the last name. But anyway, Paul was this unique guy. He was like six foot five, had hair down in the middle of his back. He wore cowboy boots. He wore a green fatigue jacket. And, on to, and he was incredibly talented. He could play guitar. He was an artist. He could draw. He was wonderful. He had amazing production. His speaking skills were off the chart. Um, he, just an amazing guy to work with. Just blew me away at how talented he was and did it so naturally. In fact, it was on your show when you did the 50th anniversary. He's the guy who did the song about MUS. Oh, yeah. That was Paul out of Detroit. Really? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, he's a, yeah, just a talented guy. But Harry Brown is another guy that jumps out. I mean, Harry Brown is this guy that makes my voice sound like I'm a little girl. He's, he's got a <laughs> set of pipes that are just ridiculous. Uh, he actually got hired away briefly, and he worked at DAI-FM, which was the FM of WLS in Chicago. Worked there three months, decided he didn't like it, and came back. But uh, he was he was that good a talent, and he was his voice was amazing. And there he went on to community college. Yeah, he yeah. ended up being a the instructor for computers. Right. Yeah, he's uh, and did fabulously well. He had a great career, and actually, at the very end, I understand he ran the community TV through he community did. college at the end. Uh, and of course, one can never talk about MUS without talking about Tim Actorhoff. I mean, yep. and there's going to be so many stories about Tim. <laughs> I mean, from everybody because. <laughs> Tim has, uh, well, first of all, I, I wouldn't have probably got into the industry, truthfully, and had and enjoyed what I did without Tim Actorhoff's uh, role in it. I mean, I have told him, I said, I give you credit for getting me into this business. I wanted to be in the business since I was 10, but you made all those things happen. And I, and I said, between you and Frank Poling, whom he knew, of course, and, uh, you know, the, everything that came together, it was really Tim that was always a, a tremendous supporter and uh, he's the one that convinced me to go to Duluth to be a manager there and that led to another part of the career so Tim really is a guy that I, I really owe my career to. And we'll be uh, doing another segment with Tim. <laughs> yeah he's he's a uh, he's a just you know he's He's a guy that, that I, I always have admired. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the guy. He's a terrific announcer. And he'll always say, well, you know, my voice isn't as good as I would have liked it to been. I said, yeah, but it's distinctive. It's distinctive. I said, your, your voice inflection skills are off the chart. I said, you know how to sell when you, when you record a commercial. Oh, yeah. You have great sales skills. And, and he's got an, a work ethic that doesn't end. Right. The man is absolutely the hardest worker. Well, I told the story I mentioned earlier today. Here's a guy who tells me one day, I'm, I'm working a weekend air shift at MUS, and he walks in and he says, yep, as of today, I have worked three straight years. I have been in this station every day for the last three years working. And that's how committed and dedicated. It's no reason, it's no surprise that MUS grew as successful as it did. Tim dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, did all the things necessary. He outworked everybody. And I, I think if you, if you look at the, the personalities like a Tim Ackeron, yep. and the other people, the people that have been involved with broadcasting, they're been involved with the community as well. Oh, yes. And not only just the broadcasting, but them as part of their persona was being involved with nonprofit organizations. And Tim is one of those kind of people, and, and yourself as well. When you're, when you're involved in this industry, yep. uh, you tend to be involved with what's going on in the community. Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and you, you, John, have done a great job of giving back. And, and I've, I, I figured that out pretty early, getting into the broadcast business. We're very fortunate. We get to play media. Oh, yeah. This isn't really a job, let's be honest. I mean, yeah, we get paid for it, and that's great, but this is like playtime, and you get paid to do this. And, and I feel very fortunate to have had that opportunity all these years. But like you, I figured out pretty early that if you're going to be this fortunate, this, this blessed, you better give back something to the community and participate and support it. It's part of the deal. Sure. Yep. Leonard, thank you very much. Thank you.
Appreciate it. I got to ask you one question. Yep. Did, yeah. did you know John Allen? I did know John, yeah. Talk about John a little bit? Yeah, a couple things I remember about John. Well, first of all, he was a great on-air talent. I remember listening to him when he was rocking in Grand Rapids on ZZM. Um, he was as attuned to the sound of a radio station. He would be on the air and it was hilarious to watch him. He, he'd like get into a break He's got, or he's running a, a song on the air. He jumps off his chair, runs to the tuning ab apparatus along the board right there next to the studio and he'd be fine tuning it. He had a phenomenal ear for what he wanted to hear on the air. And our radio station, I thought, especially when John was there, sounded as good as anybody in town. I mean, we were powerful, we were strong, we were tuned in, we were exactly what we needed to be. He would tune it, I'm not kidding, five, every five, ten minutes? He was, he was so over the top on it, but it was, it was, it made the radio station sound incredible. And, and those brought, there's a lot of broadcasters, and I don't think they fully grasp how critical that is that the station sound physically is is really uh on top of it and, and john was amazing uh the last time i saw john uh he said well i see you still have the pipes and i said well thanks john i appreciate that and of course i had just sold a radio station a few years before that we had built and he had just built this station that you're running oscar and so he was like, uh, yeah, this is really cool. Tell me what you thought about all of this. And so he and I shared all kinds of, you know, comparison notes of building a radio station. And of course he had the engineering side way down more than me. I was more into the sales and the marketing side of it because that's where most of my experience lies in the media business. But uh, yeah, John's great talent. Um, funny story with him, we're at a pool party at the president's house one summer, Bunker Rogoski. And I remember that John took some sort of a, like a, a container top that was, you know, about so big and metal. And he bonks Dan Mason on the head with it. I, I don't know how much he'd been drinking, but uh, Dan was not happy. I just remember thinking, I thought it was hilarious actually. <laughs> but uh, anyway. John was, John was smart, he, another guy that worked incredibly hard, a guy that was totally into the industry. Uh, he, was, he was a skilled broadcaster, good talent. He really had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of the package. I mean, you know, it is funny with broadcasters because some go into, um, they go into the media, the marketing side, some go on the on-air side, some go into engineering. Many of us do multiple. You know, and you got somebody like Tim Akterhoff, who was one of those guys that seemed to have his hands and fingers in all of it. He seemed to get how it all worked. But he needed engineers like John Allen to make it go the, the extra, or Mike Majeski, or people of that talent. Yeah, great talents.